individual congregations. Sometimes a congregation will be a parish. Sometimes several congregations will become a parish. Groups of parishes are organized into deaneries. Groups of deaneries then into dioceses. Group of dioceses in, are into a province. So we are part of the province of Canada, which is a little confusing because we're in the country of Canada. And Archbishop Mercy Coffin is the uh, the arch. Uh, he is the archbishop of that archdiocese. And then the provinces are made uh, into the general synod. Yeah, uh, now, so, Joanne, for a second, uh, on my screen, uh, it's still the title, uh, the title screen, the title slide. Oh, it didn't change slides. I'm just, seeing, you? I'm just seeing, you, seeing your title slide, but uh, what are you seeing? All right. Robin, what? I just see the, I just see the title screen. Nothing's moving. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. let's try this. What about now? Yeah, okay, now we got it. There you go, yeah. Now we got it? Good. It always shows two different things for PowerPoint. I'm never sure which one is which. Uh, yeah, so this, this graph is what I uh, so eloquently just described to you. Well, what's important for you to remember uh, is that, so some things congregations can decide, some things parishes have to decide, some things dioceses have to decide some things provinces, and some things general synod. So depending on what the nature of the question is, um, parishes or dioceses don't always have, don't have the authority. We're not a congregational model. We're episcopally led and synodically governed. So we're led by our bishops, governed by our synods. And so we can't just decide to do things. So when we start talking about these um, decisions, some of the question uh, happens around who gets to make this decision? And there is disagreement, even though uh, one would think the canons are clear, they're not always. So in the Anglican Church of Canada, did you see my new slide? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So in the Anglican Church of uh, Canada, the Declaration of Principles states that, um, so I'll go over these fairly quickly. Subject to the provisions of Section 7 of the General Synod, the General Synod shall have authority and jurisdictions about all matters affecting in any way the general interest and well-being of the whole church. And in particular, it lists a whole list, but for us in talking about marriage, the important was the definition of the doctrines of the church. So only General Synod, that's the national body of the church, can make decisions about the doctrines of the church and whether those doctrines are in harmony with the solemn declaration which is um, our statement uh, when we were uh, initially formed as a national church. Um, and so, uh, so if one considers marriage a question of doctrine, then only the general synod can make decisions about it. So, so marriage is a doctrine uh, and if we think of same-sex uh, unions as a matter of doctrine, which will become a question, um, only the General Synod can make decisions about that. The only way a General Synod can make a decision about that is by deciding uh, at, at its, uh, at its uh, meetings by a two-thirds majority in each house. By each house, for those who aren't Anglicans, <laughs> At General Synod, we have uh, the House of the Laity, so all the lay people vote as one group. The House of uh, the, uh, the Clergy, they vote as one group. And the House of Bishops. Now, not all decisions are by house, but decisions around doctrine are by house. And it has to have a two-thirds majority in each individual house. No, not just uh, overall majority, but in each individual house two synods in a row. So we take changes in doctrine very seriously and it's not an easy thing to do. All right? Is that clear? You yeah. with me? Well described. Okay. All right. The other thing that the Declaration of Principles says is that provincial synod, so that would be a synod that our Archbishop Coffin would preside over, that a provincial synod shall have authority and jurisdiction in all matters affecting the general interests and well-being of the church. It's very similar uh, to the other one. And this is where its authority lies. 
in the authorization of special forms of prayers, services, and ceremonies for use within the province for which no provisions have been made under the authority of General Synod or of the House of Bishops of the Anglican Church of Canada. So you can sort of see how this can go. That there, were, there have been people uh, who have looked at the forms of marriage for those uh, who are of the same gender uh, or blessing of uh, marriages of those of the same gender to be a service for which there has been no provision that has been made under General Synod and of the House of Bishops, so I have looked to provincial synods to make, um, to make that kind of uh, liturgy, a kind of worship service available to people. So there has been some difference of opinion within the national church as to where, when we start talking about liturgies, uh, that would address uh, relationships of those uh, in people who are in a same gender, same sex relationship. Um, you can see that some people think that's a national church issue and some people think that's more of a, a provincial church issue. Um, and, and so some of the, the disagreement has been about who has the authority to make these decisions. Uh, you might sort of think, well, how long have you all been talking about this? You've heard about the General Synod in 2016. Well, we've been talking about this since about the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. So you can't say we rushed into it. <laughs> and if you really want a history of statement, uh, I'm going to hope this, click, this link works. If you go to the Anglican Church of Canada website, are you going there? Can you see that? No, okay. no. We've uh, gone back to the uh, to the uh, the screen for the setup of the webinar. Okay. Let's see if I can get you. Okay. How about now? Not yet. Nope. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Nope. Got me. Gotcha. Not right. yet. Okay, so this is the page on the Anglican Church of Canada webpage, and I'm not going to go over all of it because it would take way too long. But just to give you a sense of how long we've been at this and how detailed this is. So if you go to this uh, webpage, it has uh, reports and statements and resolutions. Um, so there's various headings here that you can click. So if one wanted to get a history of statements um, by the House of Bishops, it begins in 1978, but the study actually began in 1976. And, you know, I'm just going to scroll just to give you a sense, 1976, 1978, 19, uh, 1994, 1995, 1995, 1996, 1997. You're getting a sense of like how many statements that the House of Bishops have put out, and I'm not even halfway down here scrolling. So the church has made an incredible number of statements. Generally speaking, all of the statements from the House of Bishops and the Council of General Synod have been affirming of the place of those who identify themselves as LBGTQ plus in the uh, church, as being mem whole members of the body of Christ, but uh, have differed in the statements as to how one might um, provide the most general pastoral response as possible. That's the kind of language um, that those statements have, uh, have uh, taken. There have been resolutions at General Synod since 1989. This only goes to 2004. I'm going to pick up at 2004. So if you want some more history about these statements, you just go on to this website and you will see that there have been, um, there have been uh, statements since, uh, there have been motions since 1989. Also, if we go to the resource guide for discussion, um, people sort of say, well, we haven't discussed this a lot. Well. If you, make, if you go through it, the guidelines for discussion, oh, no, I clicked the wrong one. Resources is what I wanted. 
So to say that we haven't talked about it, um, here is a list of some of the resources starting in 1994 that have been made for uh, available for the church nationally and the church uh, diocese um, for the study of this issue. And again, you see that it's an incredibly long list. I'm not sort of stopping to look at these, but I want you to get a sense of how many of these um, resources have been provided. So the church has been talking about this for a very long time. It has been studying it for a very long time. Have I gone back to the PowerPoint presentation now? Yes, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> I get really excited when I get the technology right. It doesn't happen all that often. So I want you to have some sense of how long the church has um, been discussing this and all the opportunities people have had. So sometimes people don't recall discussions because the discussions happened 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And, and, you know, and so it's been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, so while the church has been discussing, it's important for us to note, and I'm not sure, Rick, if you've covered these changes already in your class, but these are some of the significant dates uh, for Canadian law in changing this. In 1969, homosexuality is decriminalized. And then by we're, we're, only, we're only seeing your title, uh, your title slide there now. Yeah, I see. Oh. Why four, I wonder. How about now? Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah. By the goal, that PowerPoint gets me every time. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you can see that like, for Canada, and these discussions started in 1969, and by 2005, um, C-38 passes officially recognizing same-sex marriage. So um, uh, people of the same gender have been able to marry legally since 2005 in Canada. So I'm going to pick up after the 2004 General Synod because, as I said, you can go on to the national web page and get uh, all the General Synod um, uh, resolutions before that. And so at the General uh, Synod 2004, it requested that the Primacy Theological Commission, of which I was a member at the time, um, address the question of whether or not the blessing of same-sex unions, not, marriage was not language used at that time, that if the blessing of same-sex unions was a matter of doctrine. And so they released a report in 2005. Uh, the report stated that it was a matter of doctrine, but the uh, commission was very particular in how it described that. The Commission recognizes that there is a range of interpretations given to the term doctrine and that doctrines develop and change over time. We agree that the blessing of committed same-sex unions is not a matter of what is often referred to as core doctrine in the sense of being creedal doctrine. So what we meant by that is that people could have different understandings uh, and different um, views on the issue of the blessing of same-sex uh, unions and still be able in all good conscience to recite the creed. It didn't necessarily impact uh, on, on the basis, the basic tenets of truth that will be a part of the Apostles and Nicene Creed and the Creed of Athanasius as well, I suppose, technically speaking, although one rarely refers to that uh, liturgically anymore. So, so we recognize that not all, when we talk about doctrine, we're not always talking about uh, the same understanding of the term. So we are very particular that it's doctrine, but not creedal, not core doctrine. And we also express our belief, maybe that should have been phrased more our hope, um, that this would not be a communion breaking issue. That that people could have different understandings of this doctrine and still be a part of, of the world, of a worldwide Anglicanism. 
Um, the report also said that the doctrine of the church has always been definitively expressed in its liturgies. Um, such a, lit a liturgy of blessing is no exception, since it, uh, in it the church declares the activity of God towards the object of the blessing. Within the Anglican tradition, we have a phrase that uh, any of you who knew Father Boyd, uh, one of his favorite um, phrases in, is lex horrendi, lex credendi. What we pray is what we believe. So if you want to know what an Anglican believes, pick up the, the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Alternative Services, and read it. And it will tell you the nature of our belief. We express our belief most clearly in uh, our liturgies and how we pray. So when we're talking about changing something in our liturgy, we are saying something very profound about how we see God and what we see God um, doing. Uh, in the community, and so it is a very important thing uh, for us. Excuse me. Oh, I'm just recovering from a cold. So that it was, it was also the view of the commission at that time in 2005 that any proposed blessing of same-sex relationship would be analogous to marriage to such a degree as to require the church to understand it coherently in relation to the doctrine of marriage. So this is where we begin to see the church discussion moving from talking simply about the blessing of a, of a relationship um, to looking at the question of marriage. So it was certainly the Commission's um, strong belief that that's where the discussion needed to take place. Are you with me? Any questions? We are. Yeah, let's see if there are any questions either here or from anyone online or other comments. Your Grace, you've been cheek to cheek with this for uh, many years. You might have a, a comment or observation as well. Thanks for the refresher course, Joanne. Uh, <laughs> it's, a bad, it's, a bad it's like a, it's a history lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Walk down memory lane. <laughs> He's having flashbacks. He's flashbacks. <laughs> Post-traumatic stress. Put your day down. Sort of well, wait till we start talking about the general synod and said he may need some counseling. Yeah. <laughs> I'm by the door. <laughs> uh, very comprehensive and, and detailed. I wish I'd seen this some years ago. Yeah, <laughs> we were trying to uh, carry on. Yep. Any other? If anyone that have a question, just just interrupt me. Ask away. Yeah, I'll just see if anyone has any question here uh, in the room right now. Joy, or I'm disappointed you didn't mention Addy Afra though. Yeah. Well, I didn't have time. <laughs> but, but, but it is very important. I mean, the sort of notion that, you, you know, who makes the decision and it should be made locally. I was tempted to put it in there, but just to use another big word. But you've got a lot of air time. Is generally <laughs> annually? No, three, uh, three, three, three years. Every three, every three years. Anyone online with a question or comment? Okay, forge ahead, Joanne. This is very interesting. Okay. All right, so in 2000, we're going to pick up now where, um, where the other lists leave off. So in 2007, at that General Synod, they um, vote to accept um, the conclusion of the Primate Theological Commission uh, that the blessing of same-sex unions is a matter of doctrine, but not core doctrine in the sense of being creedal. So they uh, accepted that... Um, that report. Uh, and you're going to start to see a little trend here too. If you we look at the other ones, you'll see them too. That in light of the statement, um, the House of Bishops had made a statement previously, excuse me, that uh, the General Synod asked that the Primate request the Primate Theological Commission to consult with the Diocese and Parishes in advance of General Synod 2010 on the theological question of whether the blessing of same-sex unions is a faithful, spirit-led development of Christian doctrine and scripture's witness to the integrity of every human person in the question of sanctity of human relationships. Now, I have to tell you, uh, and some of you have heard this story, that um, you know, at this point we could watch um, the General Synod online and I, I screamed at my computer at this point, but it didn't really help. <laughs> it didn't stop the motions from going forward. 
Uh, so yeah, so once the commission had made the one report, um, <clears throat> they were asked to make a report on two other questions. The primate also asked, um, was asked to request. Now you probably, I don't know, uh, this is how things go, that the, the, these commissions are created by the primate. The primate has asked in order to do so, so General Synod couldn't ask these groups themselves, they have to ask the primate to ask the groups because it's, you know, we're very polite as Anglicans. Um, but he had to, they had to ask the private to request the Anglican Communion Task Force to report in advance of General City 2010 on the implications of the blessing of same-sex unions uh, and or marriage for our church and the Anglican Communion. So you have requests uh, there to look at whether, so if this is a matter of doctrine, whether it's faithful spirit-led development, whether uh, and whether how this works in with scripture's witness um, to the integrity of every human person, the question of the sanctity of relationships, and also recognizing that whatever we decide is going to have an impact on our relationships with our brothers and sisters around the world in the Anglican Communion, and to have a report on that. Uh, it also the motion also asks for support uh, to support and encourage diocese to offer the most generous pastoral provision possible within the current teaching of the church to gays and lesbians and their families. So that is the language that is used quite often in the statements of our church. It also requests the Faith, Worship, and Ministry, which is a committee of General Synod, uh, to develop a process to engage dioceses and parishes of the Anglican Church of Canada in a study of the Christian perspective of human sexuality through the lens of scripture, tradition, scripture, reason, tradition, and current scientific understanding. They were such small tasks we were given. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, but, but away the task force went to uh, create um, more resources. <clears throat> so this tends to be what happens is that we study things, we create reports, we come up with other questions, we study them, we create reports, come up with other questions. You, you can see this is this is a and repeat. So the Primus Theological Commission uh, report on this is much shorter than its previous report. Um, it reported in the Gal uh, its report on this request from General Synod is in, in what's known as the Galilee Report. It came back in 2009, and we reached no major consensus on the first question. So the question of whether or not um, this is a spirit, uh, a faithful spirit-led development of Christian doctrine. This question here, uh, we we, see, uh, we reached no consensus, and really felt. Um, that this was a question that only the church gathered in synod and gathered in prayer could make. It wasn't really a question a group of theologians could study and come up with because again we are synodically led and that whether or not it is a, a faithful and spirit-led development is really a decision of the synod and not a decision of a group of theologians. And on the second question um, we had a very brief uh, uh, reply to that, and it, uh, in sort of summary, this quote uh, speaks to it. In short, when we speak of the integrity of every human being and the sanctity of human relationships, we are speaking not of a quality inherent in ourselves, but of the destiny for which every human person was created, to become who we are made to be in Christ in conformity to the will of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the question you know, I'll be bringing you back to was um, Scripture's witness to the integrity of every human person and the sanctity of human relationships. So is our notion that those are things that we all, um, that is the destiny of every person in relationship to God through Christ and um, maybe an action of that relationship um, and not um, something um, dependent on other things. So that's some of the things I had between 2007 and 2010. And the General Synod of 2010 um, 
that affirm the statement, the attached statement of the discussion on human sexuality, and it requests it, the General Synod, to forward it to the diocesan bishops with a request to be distributed within each diocese. So General Synod, 2010, resources were prepared, they were created statements, and they were asked to be given to, um, to the diocese for further study. Um, then they also resolved that they expressed its appreciation for the initiative, commitment, and spirit of dialogue undertaken in national, international, and interdiocesan conversations regarding human sexuality and mission, and to mandate that the Faith, Worship, and Ministry Committee to continue to facilitate, support, and report on national, international, and interdiocesan conversations regarding human sexuality that began in the triennium. Um, 2007 to 2010. So again, accept the reports, please study them, appreciate the work, keep doing it. So, um, you know, and you wonder why it takes us a while to make um, decisions. It also requested that all dioceses, um, the um, military, uh, ordinary, our, our religious orders, everybody, the whole a, a national, every national structure uh, to engage in theological and scriptural study of human sexuality in the coming triennium, in conversation with gay and lesbian voices, and with the full range of theological opinion of the, Ang of the Canadian church. One of the things that <clears throat> became uh, important with uh, these studies and became more clear <coughs> was that when uh, the church was having these discussions, it was necessary that to make sure that uh, persons of various uh, sexual expressions were um, were part of the conversations, so that we weren't talking about how we relate to gay and lesbian persons, but that we were talking with gay and lesbian persons. We weren't talking about how different peoples, conservatives, evangelicals, liberals, whatever labels you want, feel about uh, uh, this issue, but we were talking with a full range of people with a full range of theological opinion in the Canadian church. Because it's really easy to have miscommunication when we're talking about people instead of engaging with them. When we engage with them, uh, we find um, that, that things are not as simple or as clear cut probably as we um, thought. So this became uh, important. I mean, it should have probably been recognized earlier, but it certainly uh, from here on becomes um, a matter of record that this is how these conversations should take place. And it, it needs to be clear, too, that it's not that there weren't gay and lesbian persons or varieties of uh, ecclesiastical and theological opinions expressed, but certainly with the gay and lesbian persons, often um, because because of the nature of, of where this discussion is in the church, uh, particularly people who are in orders, but other people as well, uh, risk some um, professional um, repercussions. I'm trying to be delicate uh, by by being out as the gay person in this conversation. And so sometimes there were people there, though though it was not necessarily publicly known that they were part of the conversation. So it became important that the people who, who were able to be publicly identified be also a part of these conversations uh, just to create uh, safe places as well for people to engage in these conversations without uh, concern about repercussions. So in 2000, we're getting close to now, 2013. Um, uh, and at General Synod, it resolved to direct the Council of General Synod to prepare and present a motion at General Synod 2016, we're getting close, uh, <coughs> to change the Canon 21 on marriage to allow the marriage of same-sex couples in the same way as opposite-sex couples. And then this motion should include a conscience clause so that no member of the clergy, bishop, congregation, or diocese should be constrained to participate in or authorize such marriages against the dictates of their conscience. So we have moved now from discussing 
um, the blessing of same-sex unions to asking for a very particular uh, motion to be brought to change canon. And so this is where the Holy Estate, which if you watched the, the video of um, last year, that's where that report comes in. And people, some people were upset with that report, but the reality is that that report was asked not to discuss whether or not it should um, present a motion, but to craft a motion that would enable this to happen. And so that's uh, what it did. So a direction really is indicated in this motion that the discussion that is to happen at General Synod 2016 was going to be about the change of the marriage canon. So that's where um, the discussion would be. That the motion that would be brought forward would also include the supporting documents that demonstrates a broad consultation and its preparation. These are the documents that are part of uh, Holy Estate. Um, that explains how this motion does not contravene social solemn declaration. So you, <clears throat> you notice there it doesn't ask whether the motion contravenes it, but how it does not, how one can look at that motion in such a way as to see that it does not contravene the um, solemn declaration. That it confirms immunity under civil law and the human rights code for those bishops, dioceses, and priests who refuse to participate in or authorize the marriage of same-sex couples on the basis of their conscience and provides a biblical and theological rationale for this change in teaching on the nature of Christian marriage. So all these are very particular in what it asks for. It's not asking for um, a two-sided argument. It's asking for very particular uh, statements uh, that would uh, enable discussion about a very particular change. So General Synod 2016, so these are the motions. Now you have, <clears throat> I probably should say that by now um, the, um, the, the, dice, the National Church of the United States they, um, has, um, approved a, has approved a change in its canon to marry those of same-sex gender. And just a month or so before our General Synod, the Episcopal Church of Scotland also made a similar change. So, so there are other national churches who have made this change uh, before uh, our General Synod. So this is how the General Synod motion uh, uh, was stated um, in response to what was asked at the uh, previous General Synod. To declare that the Canon 21 applies to all persons who are duly qualified by civil law to enter into marriage. Now, and, and, and the Archbishop can talk to this. There was some, um, sorry about that, there's some idea that, that, that Canon 21 already had that provision in it uh, and so that there was not a necessary to, to change that. Um, but, um, sorry, just Hi, I'm on a conversation online. Can I call you back? All right. Up in about a half hour. Right. Bye-bye. Sorry about that. Um, so that's the thing about doing this online. You can't prevent the phone from calling. Uh, so that uh, so to make those changes, and all of these are just about uh, changing the grammar um, uh, to parties of marriage from for a man uh, or a woman or husband of wife. So these are very much grammatical changes, um, and most significant perhaps is this, the adding that a, a minister may only solemnize a marriage uh, uh, between persons of the same sex if authorized by the diocesan bishop. So the bishop still has control over that, um, in that it, it only comes into effect uh, the January after it passes a second reading. Now, Bishop Archbishop, I don't know if you want to speak to uh, to the particularities of that motion? Uh, it was not an easy goal. I rest assured no. that uh, we could, uh, what it said was that, well, we could have done this all along and spared ourselves, you know, 40 years of conversation and agony because there's nothing said that you couldn't do it. Uh, no, and there's no prohibit. No. no. Nothing prohibitive about it. Um, it wasn't well received because sorry, it was a doctrine without, a, uh, without any liturgy or any substance to it. And uh, I thought it was best that we leave that one alone 
and, and go on to uh, some other things. The, the conscience clause thing generated a fair bit of uh, fear as well, because it started out on a, on a congregational level. But we can't have, we don't have congregations determining anything except whether to paint the, the walls of the church. Uh, so we had to, to broaden that and thin some things out. Part, if I can go back to the General Synod in Ottawa, where this resolution came from the floor of Synod, because we were going in a conversation on the blessing of same-sex unions. That was our subject matter. When that resolution came to the floor, there was some uh, debate, and then it was amended to, to the state that we now have it, about uh, marriage, the same as if you know, opposite sex couples could marry. And it was moved and seconded by someone moved by a person who is in a same-sex relationship, seconded by one of the most conservative bishops in the church. So it was a joke on the floor, and everybody laughed and says, well, in this case, it must be good. And we voted. <laughs> <laughs> and that, was a, that was a disaster because it wasn't good. It was one of those resolutions that certainly needed to be put through the filter of the resolutions committee. And we may have changed some language that would have spared us a lot of the work that had to go into it. Now, a lot of good work was done by the uh, commission, and that was presented last, uh, before last. And uh, it was, there was a summary statement of the findings and some uh, study questions for groups to bring home and do and address locally. And in some cases, that worked well. And those who went off to Synod last year were equipped to engage in the conversation and the uh, ensuing vote. Uh, going through all those synods was, <laughs> was I, I, I have to look at the mood of the church through these times. Uh, and I'm going to look at my own time from General Synod in 1995 in Ottawa. And then I, I was a, a, a priest at the time. But going back to the, my time as bishop in 2003, 7, 10, 13, and 16, the, the hostility and animosity that uh, was somewhat pre present to some extent in St. Catharines, 2003, and in Winnipeg, 2004. There was no joy. It was one of my darkest moments in my ministry, I think. Uh, and uh, at that time, I, I voted against the resolution uh, mainly because of what they called a local option at that time, which didn't make much sense to me. Uh, and, and that's where the notorious line comes in. It's like having a peen section in your swimming pool. Either we, across the Anglican Church, we do or we don't. That was my thinking at the time, and, and I wasn't alone in that. And uh, it would be very confusing for people in, in uh, Newfoundland at that time, the out-migration. Okay, supposing we did approve of, of uh, same-sex relations or marriages in Western Newfoundland, but they're working in Fort McMurray, which would probably not be of the same mind. So what are they when they get there for their two weeks on or three weeks on, and then they come back home? Uh, just you know, trying to fit into a church or a culture of, of that diversity would have been uh, nightmarish. So the, the, that was the Winnipeg said that I came away. It was, uh, there was no joy. Um, we went to Halifax from there, and there some peace was made. We learned to live with each other. We had the most, I think, the most respectful conversation, and it was a peaceful experience in existence, and we did very well. Then we went off to Ockenball. We carried it with us. And then the resolution came out. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think the work of the commission was the saving grace, I believe. It was, it was uh, enlightenment. It was genuine study. There was a lot of heart into it. But I would say in a different context this morning in a conversation with Dr. Rick, I was talking about where the church has gone. Uh, prior to my first general synod in, as bishop in St. Catharines, every morning I go to the office and open the email. I would have 25 or 35, 40 nasty emails, okay, threatening language, and, and, and not, not, wasn't church stuff. Last year, prior to General Synod, I heard from almost every gay community across the country, con every congregation that was supportive of it, and I received one email that was to the contrary. So it just tells you where, where we have gone in that uh, in a 13 year span, 12, 13 year span. Uh, but it's not done yet. Of course, we have to go through another one in 2019. 
uh, for the second consecutive uh, of two two consecutive synods to see where the church goes. Quit the journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting to have it described in such detail, uh, Joanne. Very helpful, yeah. and and you uh, your grace to be with us to kind of give the. Uh, what would you say, front row seat or uh, <laughs> driver's seat, <laughs> even perspective yeah. on it. Uh, okay, uh, anyone else with questions or comments or observations? Okay, if not, Joanne, uh, for John Madeira. All right, and this is probably another spot where the Archbishop knows far more than I do um, yeah. about the things that have happened since 2016. So, uh, and I, I'm very careful here about, I, I decided not to name bishops and dioceses because um, there's certainly been some disagreement uh, as to what exactly certain bishops meant by the things that said. Uh, so I am uh, going to sort of talk in generalities and the bishop, archbishop may want to tell some stories. Um, so uh, as most of you probably know from following the news, there was a lot of, um, um, division around the vote itself because uh, it, we went sort of to bed thinking that it was one way and woke up finding that there had been uh, some uh, computer errors and uh, the vote actually had passed. Uh, but some bishops, uh, especially once it, uh, when they thought that it was not passed, uh, had immediately stated that they would go ahead um, with the process towards same-sex marriage. So that would vary <clears throat> from diocese to diocese, uh, according to those bi uh, from those bishops, because some of those dioceses had had synodical decisions already. They had already had uh, discussions at their synod and uh, were already prepared to move ahead and uh, had been discussing this at the synod level uh, for a very long time. Uh, so some bishops were ready to immediately uh, approve same-sex marriage. Some bishops were uh, prepared to immediately start the process, you know, for their synods to approve uh, same-sex uh, marriage. Um, and then when the next morning when it was found to be an error, several of those bishops uh, continued to say that they would, given, they would continue uh, towards um, the process for same-sex marriage, not waiting to uh, the um, passing of the motion, the second reading at 2019, taking uh, the canonical legal argument that because uh, Canon 21 does not prohibit marriage of same-sex uh, uh, folk, that, it, that they did not have to wait until it was uh, particularly uh, endorsed uh, in the um, uh, by the changes. So, the, so there, so there are different. So, some bishops and dioceses said that they would go ahead uh, and have have moved ahead and uh, in that area. There were several dioceses and, uh, and bishops and some that we would have expected to move ahead who said no, um, that they would uh, they would wait and particularly some of the dioceses who had already been blessing uh, same-sex unions, that they would indeed wait until 2019 uh, and decide. And some bishops said, you know, that <clears throat> who had already had um, discussions in their diocese and said that they would wait until 2019. There were some bishops who objected to the whole process of how this decision was made and the voting process and the idea that some bishops would move ahead and some bishops would wait, and they they wanted um, some authority of, by the primate to be expressed um, to prevent uh, some going ahead, um, but the primate stated that, that was not under his jurisdiction, and um, and he could not. Um, he was not sort of a policeman to bishops. He didn't use that phrase. I'm using that phrase. I should declare not putting those phrases in Fred's mouth. Uh, so, but so there were some bishops who objected to the whole process. Uh, some bishops uh, that are committed to engaging in dialogue with their diocese. So some dioceses had not done uh, a lot of study or had not done a lot of study lately, and so so there were some uh, bishops who sort of said, okay. 
um, we can't avoid this now. We will um, engage uh, in that. And so that would be in, in my diocese, in the diocese of Central Newfoundland. That would be where we are right now. That we have um, have begun to figure out a process in which we could uh, engage more fully with the dialogue uh, within our diocese itself. I would think, uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, that Archbishop um, would be in the second group of dioceses who have already had a lot of discussion and who will wait now to 2019. Would that be correct? You're correct. Right? Bishop yeah. yeah. And, yeah, but, um, but... So encourage mm -hmm. further dialogue, but uh, until the General Synod makes a the proper decision in proper order, the protocol of yeah. consecutive General Synods. That's right, and uh, but like some some dioceses are doing a lot of study because um, they feel they need to. Some dioceses feel they've already studied it enough, and they're just going to wait uh, and and see how it uh, is going to process. So, so you you won't find same thing happening diocese to diocese, and even in the three dioceses, Newfoundland, you won't find um, you won't find the same. Um, the same process because because each diocese is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and as I already pointed out, there have been incredible numbers of opportunities uh, for people to engage, and lots of times people have engaged. But conversation just says had happened at a at a synod meeting or a meeting of clergy or a meeting of only a few people of the diocese instead of uh, sort of getting out to all of the parishes. But the House of Bishop continues uh, to struggle, it is my understanding, with questions of unity and relationships. Um, so the, there are some bishops who say um, we can, unity is not the same as uniformity, um, and so that, they, uh, that we don't all have to be doing the same thing to be unity and to walk together. And part of walking together in the body of Christ is walking together in difference. Um, and some folk feel that their relationships uh, between the dioceses have been compromised by the decision of some dioceses to move ahead without waiting to 2019. Um, so that would be my reading of what's happening now. And again, Archbishop uh, Coffin could probably speak to that um, we, uh, more particularly. In someone's wisdom, traditionally, every three years, there's a meeting of the House of Bishops twice a year. Every three years, and traditionally before the General Synod, there would be a House and Spouse meeting. The bishops would bring their, their partners along, and usually it was before General Synod because you didn't want to deal with the business of the General Synod to, to, to overshadow anything. But in recent times, I think it was when Archbishop uh, uh, Andrew Hutchison was primate, we met following the General Synod as House and Spouse. And that's what happened last fall in Winnipeg, right after the General Synod. And we're much better behaved when we have our partners with us. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> and, uh, and that happened because, you know, following the General Synod last summer, there was some division, there was a, a party, uh, a bishop's signatory to a letter, which was threatening the unity of the church. And... Uh, we went to the House of Spouse with some fear and trepidation there that how deep will this run and, and what will it do to us as a body. Uh, the Prime had dedicated our, the business side of our meeting to the relationship thing. How can we live with one another? And we walked away from there with the confidence that we will be together for the next House of Bishops. There's no indication that anyone was going to walk. And so that was a great console, uh, great consolation, I think, to him. And so we, and because it was a house and spouse, like I say, we our agenda is limited. We do more social and and uh, inter, you know, uh, we, we try to relate with one another on a social level, because it, uh, it creates a, a good playing field. But we'll go to the house uh, meeting this spring in April, and uh, I expect it could be a bit different. Uh, there will be the extreme positions upheld, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but you, you made a, a comment there about the unity and uniformity of the church. And I remember Calvin Andrews, a Pentecostal pastor on the West Coast, preaching that World Day of Prayer one time. And he talked about the union and unity. He says, you can take two cats and tie them together by the tail, and you'll have a union. <laughs> the uniformity is questionable. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> as the House of Bishops, right here. <laughs> I think we're we're still we're still in union. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but so, uh, Joanne, that was a tremendous presentation, a, a very comprehensive view, and uh, no stone unturned. Yes, I still I still have some more slides, but if there are any questions, mm -hmm. I just want to sum up a few things that I think we need to sort of recognize. If, if I still have you, I think I. Oh, I got indeed, a few indeed, it's very very informative and um, a good discussion. Thank you, uh, Joe, and continue on, my dear. Oh, all right, so let me just see. What... So, what like looking at all that sort of happened, the history. What are some of the things? Oh, my goodness gracious, what just happened? I don't know what happened. There we are, back yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, but I don't want me. I, I need to get to the right slide. Yeah, there we go. There we are. What have we learned? Um, so, uh, these are some of the things, you know, me looking at it, we've learned that when the church, particularly the Anglican Church of Canada, but I would think this is holds true of many churches, begin, begins a discernment process around an ethical matter. It is a very long and complicated process. I know uh, when I was teaching this uh, the winter, like the students were like, like come on, make a decision. <laughs> But, you know, as is the church, it only takes us a few hundred years to make a decision. Um, but but it's, not, it's not a light matter, and it's not a decision that can be made quickly. Uh, it involves a lot of different things. Uh, one thing that I didn't talk about in the, in, the, um, in the presentation, but, you know, is a given for us as Anglicans, is that when we consider anything like this, when we look at the question of marriage, for us, we have to look at it in terms of the witness of scripture and the witness of tradition and the witness of reason. Um, and we have to recognize that these things are not easily or simply delineated from one another. So when we look at what scripture says about marriage, we're always looking at it through the lens of tradition because we can't read scripture without hearing all the sermons and all the lectures and all the things that we've heard about that piece of scripture before and we can't read it without our minds and the things that we've learned. Mm -hmm. um, so these, these things are really hard to, to, to take them apart and suggest that uh, some people would like to play one against the other and I, I don't think that's as easy to do. But for Anglicans in, in making decisions, um, scripture, tradition, and reason um, are fundamentally a part of all of uh, our decisions and we have to take the witness of all three uh, and, and take them all seriously uh, in, in making a, a decision. And I, I didn't talk about that, so, but I do think that those things are, are very important. A few weeks ago in class, Joanne, we were talking about these matters, like how where teachings come from and, and you know things emerging and what have you. And I uh, referred, uh, we spent a little bit of time chatting about uh, Macquarie's uh, uh, idea of, you know, it's, uh, as you say here, scripture, tradition, and reason, and experience, Macquarie brings into it as being such an important... Uh, it's a little bit more Methodist. <laughs> Pardon me? I said the experience part is a little bit more Methodist, but okay. Yeah, yeah. but with that, I think it's very real, it relates very much to the, to the, how we bring out what is in tradition and, uh, and reason. Definitely. Well, we can never, you know, um, a lot of scholars suggest that like, even in terms of looking at scripture, uh, I don't know how it's taught these days, but back, way back in my day when I was taught at university in the 80s, you know, it was very much exegesis, right? You have to get, you have to separate yourself from scripture and get to what it actually meant. And, you know, the recognition is that really we can't, that's not really possible. It's always intergesis, right? It's always we always bring a part of ourselves and our experience, we, the people we know, the stories. Like, we can say we don't bring experience or tradition or reason into it, but it's impossible not to mm. uh, because we're human. Mm. And, uh, and we need to own that. Uh, and so sometimes what we hear in Scripture has a lot to do with what we expect to hear from Scripture. So, um, and so it's often difficult for us as humans 
to put down our barriers to allow scripture to really uh, challenge us in, 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 you know, in, in the sort of Christian language to convict us, right? And so it's very difficult because we, all, we, ha we always come at it through these other lenses. Uh, the questions around liturgical change, uh, and marriage is a liturgical, uh, is, is a liturgy for us, and it's also sacramental within the Anglican tradition, uh, speaks to what we fundamentally believe. So we don't change liturgy easily. Um, and again, I talked to before about lex horrendi, lex cudendi, but it's also lex horrendi, lex cudendi, lex horrendi. What we pray, we believe, is what we do. So it, it influences how we live our lives out. So how we choose to create a marriage service speaks all you know more about speaks a lot about how we live our faith. And so it's it's very important to us and, and can't be separated uh, from what we believe about who God is. Um, it must take it must consider relationships within its own members, the Anglican communion, and with its ecumenical partners. And I think Archbishop um, Percy talked well about that, that how the primate called the House of Bishops into to unity of relationship. Uh, and so we need to recognize that we are all part of the body of Christ. We're all members. And, you know, uh, I love that, um, that, that part in, in Corinthians 12. And so we're all members of the body, and what one part of the body does does have an influence on the other parts of the body and an effect. So we need um, to be mindful of that, that it's not just about what we want to do, but we need to be mindful of the witness of, of our ecumenical partners and the Anglican communion, and we hold those things together. Um, and as I've already sort of said, we are, must undergo extensive periods of prayer, study, and discernment, and repeat. <laughs> and repeat, and repeat, <laughs> until we are sure, right? And that's the thing, like when people ask me, why do we have to keep repeating these things? We've already done them, but we're not sure. We have not discerned soundly and clearly um, the voice uh, of the Spirit. And uh, for us who are synodically led as Anglicans, we believe that the Holy Spirit does speak through our synods. And so until we're clear, uh, we will continue to repeat um, until we, we feel that we've gotten some clarity on that. And, and while we talk about relationships and we talk about the communion um, and things like that, we might give moral authority to the communion, to um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, to the primates, to the Anglican Consultative Council, but in the end it's really only a decision that can be made by the discernment of the body of Christ gathered in prayer. Um, this is a decision that the Anglican Church of Canada will have to make for itself. Uh, it will have to make that decision in prayer, gathered uh, from across the nation, representing the body of Christ. And that is really, um, and that is really the only way that we can make a decision. All the studies, all of the advice, all of the voices we can take into consideration, um, but it, it is really the body of Christ gathered in prayer that makes those decisions. So really, where are we now? We study, we do some more study, and we pray. We, I should say pray and more prayer. We, we use prayer and more prayer. And, and like I said, it's not, it, it's still in process. That's my last slide. Well, Joanne, this has been awesome, wonderful. I was thinking, uh, just the latter part of your presentation, I doubt there's another theology school in Canada where that would have such a presentation on the topic. An archbishop who's been cheek to jowl with the issue for a long while, such uh, information. What a great experience it is for all of us. And I, uh, I have it recorded here on our, uh, on our uh, webinar uh, program for the benefit of other students who might want to view it uh, now or later. But... Um, just going to ask if there are any questions or comments or observations, particularly at the pastoral level. I, I, I suspect that pretty well every pastor is being uh, prompted one way and another by people who are wrestling with those issues themselves and within their families. Probably some parishioners approach their pastors with a 
resistance to it and trying to respond uh, pastorally to the day-to-day -day issues, probably one of the things that, uh, that is uh, most challenging to the local pastor in, in congregations. Just ask you, Joanne, as a, a pastor in, in, in a community and connected to many other clergy in our province and elsewhere, and, and they knew your grace as a, a pastor of the pastors who have both uh, members of the, of the diocese and broader church and uh, the pastors as well coming forward with practical issues and so on related to the matter, how it is playing out and whether there's a sense that there's a kind of a, a shift in uh, openness uh, uh, over the time lag since it all started, especially from the 90s uh, up to the present. But Joanne, from yourself, any uh, comments and observations? Well, I think uh, there's been various things. Perhaps the most shocking has been, and, and several of the clergy in our diocese have noted this, is the complete lack of um, of concern. That you know, you know, we uh, a lot of us expected the summer when it was carried in the news that we would have parishioners, you know, upset and calling us and and things like that. Uh, I had none. Uh, several of my other friends had none. Um, some people uh, said, um, you know, that they had thought that we had already decided that. So I think some people thought that once the legal uh, aspect changed that, that some of the churches changed as well. And so they just sort of thought that that was done in 2005 with the change in law, um, particularly people who aren't actively, you know, in every day. Um, there are, I mean, I, I've heard some of my friends, uh, some of my colleagues who have said the thing that they sometimes hear is people's concern and this is not just about this issue, but it certainly has come up uh, several other issues. I've heard this kind of concern that when the church um, teaches something that people have not heard before, the people have this sort of concern that, well, if what, you know, I was a taught as a child by Reverend blah, blah, blah is not true anymore, like what else is not true anymore? And so whether or not that's, you know, the blessing of same-sex unions or uh, whether it's the um, uh, marriage or divorce persons or um, people who, these, uh, children receiving communion before confirmation, whatever it is, different things that they were taught or traditions that they understood to be um, forever and ever amen, when they encounter those changing, it does bring about some, some questions about whether or not, um, uh, you know, what, what is it that can't change? Does everything change? Is, like, is there anything I can count on? Is there anything true? So you get those kinds of conversations. But uh, I would say a far majority of people in our parishes have family members who are living in long-term, monogamous, committed, um, same-gender relationships. And uh, so their experience of people in those relationships have changed their minds already. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joanne. Your Grace, any, any particular thoughts, insights from your own? You know, um, I think it's the fact that we have opened it up and had conversations and it's familiarity and an acknowledgement. I think we've come out of the Victorian era some, to some extent <laughs> and uh, the, the, the whole conversation around sex is different now. We say the word in households and uh, I think we're recognizing that the, the it's sexuality, not just homosexuality or heterosexuality, whatever mm -hmm. we were, and, and, and the value of the human being, I think, is, is being raised up as well. Mm -hmm. The dignity of every human being. Mm -hmm. And once you start talking that, you've got to go to the, the, the whole gamut of the, what they are, mm -hmm. their orientation is. I, I kept thinking about the baptism of the the dignity of every human being. the last question is. Right. And I prefer you want to answer that when I'm here doing confirmations of baptism, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. Yeah. Yeah. The whole person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is a good connection, as, uh, Holly. Any other comments or observations? Uh, I would like to say, the, I'm not sure who said that about the baptismal vow, um, but I do think 
again, the whole ex serenity, ex serenity, when we pray something continually, it changes who we are, changes how we believe. Uh, and so I, I, like, I think it is profoundly linked that when we change our language around prayer, we pray to be able to respect the dignity of you, every human being. Mm. We learn to respect the dignity of every human being. Oh, indeed. And particularly if these are matters of prayer, well, when people are assembled, uh, and in private prayer as well, I mean, the Spirit has to breathe into us. And, but it is interesting in the broader context of Christianity as well, how, uh, as I started, started, how this debate within the Anglican Church of Canada is informative to others, and uh, unity. We, we uh, uh, you, both of you have mentioned the word about unity and uniformity, but in its own way, it kind of uh, brings out a different aspect of unity that I think uh, we hadn't appreciated up until fairly recently, and that is that within Christianity, we have more scope than we have within denominationalism, and uh, I think many are becoming more appreciative of that than, uh, than we had been. And, and this particular issue, from my observation, I think has given us uh, uh, insight into how uh, people within Christianity see options to go elsewhere, we might say, and be part of other different communities than they would have uh, in the past. In our family, we often uh, you know, chat about the way that... Uh, we were raised, uh, we didn't, uh, you know, growing up in small Irish Catholic community in St. Mary's Bay, there was no one else. <laughs> so we, the notion of uh, Christian unity was easy to live as long as you didn't have to deal with anyone different. <laughs> and there weren't many. But uh, we have to say, you know, the, the, the way that we understood practicing the faith was that you know, you should uh, attend church and be part of your church and all that kind of stuff. But if you're not going to support and attend your own church, at least don't go somewhere else. <laughs> and that was the, the mindset of it. I don't think it was unique to that community or that denomination either. But it's a blessing that we're past, uh, past it. But I find this issue, many people in circles that I travel in, my own family included, that they see this debate in the Anglican Church is informative to all of us, but also they see it as a an option for people who uh, feel that they're not as welcome within their traditional community. So that's kind of that different as well. I'll ask uh, Ross or Anna if you have any particular thoughts or insights you know, from the Pentecostal assemblies and, and Fraser's online as well. You'd uh, come from a, a different uh, perspective on this, but as we chatted about last week, doesn't mean the issues are not there to be dealt with and, and challenging as well. Uh, it's really interesting, uh, very interesting, in fact, to hear um, how the process has unfolded. Uh, you know, uh, again, not not familiar with uh, you know the way of governance. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah. very, uh, very interesting. Um, I find it interesting how uh, matters of doctrine, you know, um, two consecutive synods. Mm -hmm. So it, it speaks to the um, high view of doctrine that uh, certainly exists. And so I find that very, um, very interesting. Uh, one, one question I, I had uh, towards the end, um, I think on the slide, what have we learned? It said that some bishops have decided to to move the process along. So, what does that mean? Does that mean now that you can have um, certain dioceses that are now going to go ahead and perform uh, same-sex marriages, and others won't be until the next between now and the next synod? That's what the statements indicate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, others actually happen happen or happening. I, and so, there will be nothing to the next nothing month. to prevent that. No, there's nothing to prevent it, and I couldn't find any any diocese that I, I checked a few websites where I thought it would be. Some dioceses have asked for the creation of liturgies, but I haven't seen any public indication that liturgies have taken place. So I've heard privately that they have, but I haven't seen any publicly. So that's why I wouldn't state because I I can't confirm them. 
So no, there were texts prepared for the lesson of same sex union, yeah. lesson of civil. No, yeah. Mm. But I, I haven't heard of any marriage thing either. Mm. Yeah, no, there, there's some bishops have requested their preparation. I don't know that uh, they've been publicly shared. Mm. Not that I could find, anyhow. Mm. But I guess the the process probably informs everyone that even those who would probably be putting on pressure to make change abruptly and what have you would, as they see things emerge, would probably uh, adjust their pace for the sake of unit. Yeah. Hopefully they would, or at yeah. least they would be somewhat silent and discreet if they felt the need to do something in individual circumstances that they wouldn't uh, do to the and, and be disruptive to you. Yeah, I would say too, um, I have an interesting story. A friend of mine uh, was performing a marriage last year. It was it was a traditional uh, couple, not a same gendered couple, uh, a younger couple, but they were um, very much wanting to ensure that the language of their marriage was inclusive and wasn't uh, overly gender specific. And uh, so it was really interesting, like she said, sitting down with them and sort of figuring out what parts of the marriage service that they could change, like uh, gender, like he, she's, and they's, and things like that. But but was she that that was very interesting? Was it that it wasn't just same sex folk who are looking to get married who are looking to see that the liturgy changed to be more inclusive? Uh, heterosexual couples who have. Um, LGBTQ people in their families were anxious that this service would be able to make all of them comfortable. So, you know, these changes will need to have be to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So, what are the options right now? I'm sorry, question of ignorance. But what are the options right now? Say, for example, in a in diocese, or in, in, in a diocese where the bishop or those problems even potentially might decide that they're going to go ahead and bless and marry same-sex couples. As far as liturgy is concerned, is there anything for them? There isn't a prescribed at this okay. point. And, and uh, as Joanne said in the earlier presentation on provincial yeah. jurisdiction, there are different problems with author and such a right. Yes. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to wrap up this part of it here. The uh, students in the course will uh, take a break and come back uh, in about 10 minutes to uh, continue on with some other stuff. Joanne, this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, a great presentation, so thorough and, uh, and informative and complete. Much appreciated. And uh, your grace, great to have you. Good, good timing. And, uh, and uh, as I say, I'm proud of... Uh, our students who were in the course and those who were not to attend uh, today to get this uh, a glimpse on this very timely and, uh, issue in the church. And uh, as I said, I'd be a bit concerned if uh, you head out from here and uh, people are asking, what are they, what are you doing on this at Queens? I've never heard of it before. I'd be, <laughs> I'd be a bit concerned. But now we got it uh, well done today. And of course, the debate continues and we will here and, and everywhere as well, but a, a great session. Thanks, Joanne. Enjoy the rest of your evening, the rest of the week, and the rest of Lent, and all that you're, you're into. We'll be in touch soon, I'm sure. All right, then. Take care. Great. Right. Thanks, Joanne. Great. We'll break for a few minutes, okay? For those who were here just for this part of the class, uh, thanks for coming, and best of luck.